Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. This is a really exciting event for a couple of reasons. The first one being that February is a pretty important month here. Every February, we kick all the men out for the month, and we host uh, Women in Science, Exploration, Conservation, and Adventure. So we've had a lot of great events so far, and we still have another week and a half or so uh, of events to go to introduce you to, to some amazing women uh, in science and exploration. The other reason why this is an exciting day is we get to take a little virtual field trip to hang out with the crew from Hearts in the Ice. So we'll be chatting with Sunva Sorby and Hilda Strom shortly. Uh, for those who might be new uh, to what they're up to, in 2019-2020, they made history when they became the first women to overwinter in Svalbard solo. They spent 12, 12 months at the remote trapper's cabin called Bumsabu, located at 78 degrees north and 140 kilometers from their closest town of Long Year uh, being in Svalbard. Climate change is not taking a break, so neither are they. They return to Svalbard in November and will be overwintering uh, at Bumsabu until May 2021. Together with a team of 10 global partners, Hearts in the Ice is a bridge between citizen science, uh, global citizens, and helping us better understand uh, climate change and why we all need to play a role. So as they continue to serve as citizen sciences, tests on a variety of projects, from observing the clouds, the auroras, flying drones to monitor the ice, even collecting phytoplankton sam er, samples as they build on their second year of data collection. So I'm going to turn things over to Hilda and Sunova for just a little bit, and then we're going to get to talk to a really cool scientist about Arctic foxes. We have a great uh, live event for all of our classrooms today. If you're tuning in via YouTube, use that chat sidebar. Let us know where your class is watching from, and I'll be watching uh, for your questions as well. So Hilda and Sunova, it is great to have you uh, joining us live today. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. And thank you to Eva joining us as an expert. And hi to everybody out there. Thanks for joining the call. And um, this is Hilda. I'm going to share some updates from Bumstabu. And we are up here uh, at this little trapper's cabin, as Joe just uh, talked about. It's, um, it's the size of a normal king size bedroom, maybe. It's 215 square meters. And um, we are pretty close to the North Pole. So um, we just received daylight at Pompsebu after three months of complete darkness. And today we saw the sun in the mountaintops shining in there. And that's absolutely amazing for us. We've been walking around here in complete darkness for so long. And the sun uh, will arrive here so we can actually see the sun March the 8th. Eight, the same day as the International Women's Day. That's fantastic. So a little bit about this winter um, compared to last winter. Um, last winter was a, a, a normal, what I would say, a normal polar winter. It was cold, just how it's supposed to be. Um, we had sea ice. We had a lot of snow. Uh, it was um, it was good for, for all the um, species living up here. Um, but the trend we have seen the last 10, 15 years is, is not like that. It's more like this winter. Now it's really mild. Um, outside now it's 3 minus degrees. And we have had a lot of rain this winter. Um, so it has been raining, snowing, raining, snowing, and we have no sea ice. So we have actually been kayaking lately and um, taken a CCD, and that is a... Um, it's a kind of a tool that measures the temperature in the sea. And it's, it's actually very cold out there. It's um, 1.3, um, 1.4 minus degrees. So it's um, starting to create sea ice, but it's not um, cold enough in the air. So um, it's, it's, and that's, that's a struggle because we, uh, due to the rain, we also then have ice on the tundra. And that is a problem for the reindeer and for the foxes that Eva is going to talk about, and also the the ptarmigan, um, because they have hard um, they have a hard time to get down through the ice down to their food plants, and also the the polar bears are struggling because they need the sea ice in order to hunt their main food source, which is seals, and the seals again are struggling because they need the the, the sea ice to to breathe. So. 
It, um, there is also one more thing. We have been following um, the po a polar bear from Norwegian Polar Institute. It's called, the name of it, it's actually kind of weird, it's called N26131. And this polar bear, um, we came across um, due to, we got the uh, position, she has a collar around her neck that calls in to the scientists every evening, telling where she is, um, the temperature, literally, literally how she's doing. And she uh, came, we came across her last spring and could tell the scientists that if, uh, upon the COVID was not out uh, doing field research. And we can tell, uh, tell the research that uh, she actually had a, a cub last year. Um, it was a beautiful little, little cub, so healthy, um, seemed to be strong. But uh, a month after, um, she w she probably lost that uh, cub, and we could um, we could confirm that July when she came uh, past the, the hot chair without the cub. But this year, she's actually having um, new cubs, and the problem now is due to the mild winter is that the den, the sort of the snow uh, cave, she has uh, digged and stayed in now for uh, a month and a half already, almost two months. To, to give birth to the cubs, uh, that is so thin because of the too little snow. So it's actually cold in there. So the color that calls in her data every night tells her that she's colder inside of them. The insulation is, is less. So, but hopefully she will come out with um, a live cub this year too. And um, just a little bit about um, our polar bear visits here at the hut. Uh, we have had um, 10, 15, 10, 12 polar bear uh, sites at the hut. And one of them came, we've had several of them coming up to, to, the, um, to the door here or to the, um, to the walls around the hut. But one of them were actually, we heard it, we dressed up, uh, took our flare guns and headlamps and went outside. And it was actually blocking our outside door. So, um, but it's, it, scared it and it um, ran off for uh, 20, 30 meters maybe and we got to um, to view this beautiful creature on a uh, kind of safe distance. But they are so curious and um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how all the wildlife around us is going to survive or if they are going to survive this winter. So Sinua, maybe you have some more updates. Joe, can you hear us okay? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Awesome. Um, well, I just wanted to uh, two things. One, just a little bit about what we've been up to here. Um, and, you know, Joe, shout out to you. It is awesome for us to be able to join via satellite uh, from way up here. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't have here, like the ability to have a chat. Uh, we don't have any stores nearby, um, we don't have TV, but we do have uh, two lifelines and one of them is what we're talking to all of you on right now, which is our Marlink satellite data. Um, it's a little dish that sits outside and we can communicate from here with all of you. And the second thing is um, our snowmobile and we are so happy um, to have BRP, they make these um, incredible snowmobiles. To have that up here because it is uh, truly one of one of our. It's the second lifeline that we have up here. Um, we actually, Joe, if you can tee up a couple of those windmill sh um, uh, photos that I sent you, the one inside the cabin. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, no running water up here and no electricity. So we rely on solar, our solar panels, and a windmill. And wouldn't you know it, the windmill stopped working. That is really a bad thing. So so um, we've had a spare little windmill here, and we just replaced it today. Um, and we used our snowmobile as like an anchor to pull the whole thing tight enough um, so that we could fasten it all. So it's uh, pretty amazing to be able to have like a big anchor like that. We also use the snowmobile um, to uh, to get Etra. Um, she's been sick and so we received her, we got her, uh, a boat came in here and we had to 
use the snowmobile uh, as an anchor so we could lower ourselves with a rope and full-on survival suits into the slushy water, very cold, as Hilda mentioned, and um, then get Etra from a boat. So uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Everything is up to here is, um, I don't know, how do we say, old school? <laughs> it's not... <laughs> It's a, it's a little bit challenging. Um, we also use the snowmobiles to collect wood because no trees grow up here on Svalbard, uh, but lots of logs float in with the circumpolar current. And you know what else floats in, which is ties into our theme of the month uh, for citizen science is plastic. And uh, because of the circumpolar currents, lots of marine debris like fishing nets, things can get caught in fishing nets. Um, lots of plastic, you know, single-use water bottles, we've seen plastic shoes, we've seen all sorts of things float up on the, uh, the shoreline here, so we've been collecting that. And um, it's up to you, Joe, we can either show that short video now or we can wait for it later. Uh, let's jump right into the presentation, maybe we can share it after. Let's do that. All that right. sounds awesome. And um, just to say a big thank you to, to Eva Fugli for joining us because um, we've had a lot of wildlife here since November, bearded seals, reindeer, polar bears, fox, ptarmigan, uh, but the foxes are the ones that really cap captivate us. So I'm um, very happy to have Eva join us today and hand it back to you now, Joe. All right. Awesome. Well, it's so great to get an update uh, from Bum Sabu. So for the students who might not be sure, um, I'm holding my phone because they're so far north um, that the only way to connect is via satellite phone. So they're calling us via satellites uh, to make these updates uh, for each of these events, which is pretty cool. All right, it is time to introduce our speaker. We've got Ava Fugle joining us. She, her experiences with Arctic foxes in Svalbard go back to the early 90s when she got a chance as a young student to participate in field work studying them. Now she leads an annual program monitoring and researching them, as well as the Svalbard uh, Rock Ptarmigan for the Norwegian Polar Institute. So I am gonna bring uh, Eva live from Norway into the call with us. Hi Eva, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? We're great, we're great. It's so, glad, or so good to have you joining us today. We've got awesome classrooms joining us. Um, via camera, and then I'm looking at the chat. We've got classrooms in Alberta, in Guelph, Ontario, in Arthur, Oakville, Minnesota. So we've got lots of classrooms hanging out with us today. That's fantastic. And I'm so uh, happy to be able to uh, join you and to be able to talk to so many uh, fantastic uh, people and uh, students and young uh, people. I like that. Thank you. All right, excellent. Well, if you're ready, I know you have an awesome presentation with some great photos and little video clips for us so we can get to know the Arctic fox. Yeah, do you want me to share it, share my screen? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll, we'll try. All right, I have a feeling <laughs> we can do it. Uh, me too. Let me see. Uh, yes. All right, so far so good. Yeah, can you, should I now start my presentation? Yeah, let's pop it up. Let's go full screen and then, yeah. yeah, there we go. Looks good. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much again. I, um, I, I'm, as uh, the presentation uh, about me, I'm an Arctic fox uh, researcher. And uh, so this presentation will be about the Arctic fox and uh, some of my work uh, in Svalbard. And um, I will give, go, uh, talk you through um, the first life uh, or the first year uh, of an Arctic fox, from it's born in a den, in a breeding den, and until it has to leave. And um, I will also talk a bit about um, how they are adapted and things like that, but also I will end my talk by showing you um, and to tell you about the famous female Arctic fox that did this long walk. She walked from Svalbard and ended up in Canada. So that will, will be the end of my talk, but I will then start See, I'm not able to to um, have the presentation go there. Okay, now I manage. So, um, Arctic foxes—they live uh, on the top of the world. They are this. Um, they this is a map showing uh, showing actually uh, the world from the top of the world. This is the North Pole, and this colored around 
uh, this yellowish uh, color is actually the area where Arctic foxes live. So we say that they have a circumpolar distribution. It means that they are living all around the Arctic. And since they are living up here together with the polar bear, I like to call them a character species of the Arctic. Um, and Arctic foxes, since they are living up there, uh, it's very, very cold and it's, uh, it's not a lot of food to find and to eat. They need to be have a very, very good adaptation to live in conditions like that. It's very cold. And this picture is actually showing the extremely good fur uh, of the Arctic foxes. They, Arctic foxes has the best isolated fur of all animals on, on the earth. So they are super, super uh, adap adapted. So they protect themselves from the cold with a thick fur. It's also so that if you look at the paws of the of an Arctic fox, they are also covered with fur. And if you look at the Latin name, which is Vulpes Lagopus, it actually means the hair-footed fox. And that is uh, turning on the, the, that the paws are actually covered by hair. And the reason for why they are covered by hair can be many. Maybe it is an isolation from walking on the cold surface, or maybe it's an, it makes them walk uh, with no sound when they are hunting for, for, for their prey. Another thing that is very, very special for the Arctic fox is that they come in two colors. They come in the white and the blue. They are all Arctic foxes and they belong to the same species, but there are much more, a uh, higher number of white foxes compared to blue foxes. But it's important to know that um, they are also blue. And the fox that walked all the way from Svalbard to Canada was actually a blue fox. The pictures you see here is actually an um, Arctic foxes with the winter fur. They also have another uh, thing that is special. That is that they change their fur from winter to summer. So this is a white fox in summer fur. And as you see, uh, that fox has changed uh, the color of its fur completely. Now it's actually gray on the back, and then it's quite uh, light white on the belly. Uh, the blue fox on the other side keep the color on the summer fur. The fur is much shorter, of course, but it's completely dark all over. So the only way to separate those two foxes from uh, in the summer fur is actually to look at, do the fox has a white belly? Okay, then it's a white fox. Then I will continue to say something about what do the foxes eat? And this is a drawing showing, um, showing a seal and a seal pup on the sea ice because Arctic foxes do hunt seal pups. And this is the sea, sea water, this is the seal mother. She has digged a hole in the sea ice and she has even digged a snow cave. And inside this snow cave, she gave birth to her pup, a seal pup. Arctic foxes can smell a seal pup from more than three kilometers away. And Arctic foxes are able to dig through the roof of this, uh, this, um, this uh, cave and kill a seal. And I would, would like to show you a picture taken by National Geographic. They managed to take three fantastic pictures showing a fox, this is an Arctic fox, this is the sea ice and it's actually on the snow, this is the <laughs> it's snow covered and this is a fox jumping high up in the air, all four uh, legs up in the air, diving down, digging through and killing a, a, a seal pup uh, under uh, when it's lying in the snow cave. So this is, <laughs> this is a way of the fox to find food. But, Foxes also, um, they don't only hunt themselves, they also, we call them scavengers. That means that they are, uh, they can eat uh, carcasses or, uh, yeah, carcasses of dead uh, animals. <clears throat> this picture is quite fantastic, I think, because this is from the sea ice and the sea ice is covered by snow. And if you can take a look at these footsteps, this is the footsteps of a polar bear. So. Arctic foxes are following polar bears and they are eating the leftovers from the polar bears when they have killed a seal. So these footsteps show the polar bear has been walking here, it killed a seal here and it actually, they eat the blubber of the seal. But 
there are a lot of leftovers. And the foxes, the leftovers is, um, is a very good food for the foxes. Another very nice thing with this picture is that you see both the white color morph or the type, and then you see a blue color type. So this is a picture showing uh, uh, both, uh, both Arctic foxes uh, with both colors, and they are in the winter fur, as you see. But I also would like to show you <laughs> that um, they are scavengers. And of course, it's so important for Arctic foxes to, to find carcasses. And this is a reindeer carcass. And I will show you a movie now. It is annoying sound on that movie, but I like to show it anyway so that you can see. Yeah. This was an Arctic fox uh, feeding on eating on the carcass, reindeer carcass, because it's so important for Arctic foxes to find uh, carcasses to, eat, to be able to eat and have a good body condition so that they will be able to have uh, pups and to, uh, to um, bring up pups um, in, in the spring. And then I would like to show you, this is, actually, this is actually a breeding den, an Arctic fox breeding den. And they are digged out uh, in the ground and they have many tunnels. This is a tunnel, this is a tunnel, and this is a tunnel, and Arctic foxes are digging uh, digging uh, new tunnels all the time and try and and try to uh, expand uh, the, the the breeding dam, and these dens are very old. They can be more than 100 years old, and uh, a couple of uh, Arctic foxes may uh, have a den as long as they live. They can live maybe three to four years, and when they die, another couple are taking over the den. So the dens are really really important. A den can den can also be actually under some stones. So it's not necessarily always uh, digged out uh, in the ground. But it's important to know that when Arctic foxes give birth to their pups, that is when uh, it's full winter in Svalbard. So they give birth to their pups in uh, approximately uh, middle of May. And in middle of May in Svalbard, it's completely covered with, with snow. And the only thing you can see from the, from the den is actually a, a hole in the snow and a lot of fox tracks to and fr that had walked to that hole. So when the mother is giving birth to the pups, she is lying inside, the, it's digged down in the snow, and then you have the den under here, and she is giving birth to the pups uh, in, in May. And then you can have uh, between six or seven, and even up to 11 pups. And when they are born, they are very, very tiny and very, very light. They, their body mass is maybe 50 gram. And the only thing they do is that the female is giving them uh, milk and she is warming them with her fur. And during that time, the male or the father is bringing food to the female or the mother. And then uh, the foxes, the pups are growing quite fast. So after three weeks, they emerge from the den. And um, then they start to, or they continue to drink milk from their mother for a while. But after a while, they start to eat, re eat real food. And this is a picture taken with an automatic camera. And here you can see uh, this is real food because this is an Arctic fox attacking um, pink-footed goose nest. So they have their nest here. And an Arctic fox are actually able to kill an adult uh, uh, goose. Uh, they also steal their eggs and they also kill uh, the gooselings, of course, then to give, give uh, food for their pups. Uh, this is a picture taken with an automatic camera again, and this, is, this shows the daily life on the den. And of course, the pups are playing around, they are fighting, they are practicing how to be able to hunt for themselves. And this is an adult sitting here. And the adults bring food to the den all the time, and this is uh, this was a very this is a very successful den, and you can see some food leftovers here from birds. So after the the, the pups are on the den approximately uh, till around uh, the end of or the middle of August, and then the pups are approximately three months old, and then the parents stop bringing food to the foxes. So then they have to go out and they have to hunt for them for themselves. And um, 
that is can be quite uh, difficult for young foxes, but that's uh, the tough life in the Arctic. And some foxes go, stay close and some foxes go far. And now I would like to start to talk about the, the, the famous female Arctic fox that did the long walk. She actually, if you take a look at this uh, map, you know Hilda and Sunival, they are at Bomsebu down here. And the fox that did the long walk, she was actually born here, a bit further north. And uh, she stayed for a while in the same area before she started to walk. And she started to walk when she was approximately 10 months old. And then she started to walk and went left Spitsbergen here on the sea ice. And she walked all the way on the sea ice. And if you take a look over here, you can see this is showing this is showing the movement rate or how fast she was walking. So on the sea ice, she had quite high, high speed. And the highest speed she actually had here when she moved over the big glaciers on Greenland. And then she walked all the way to Ellesmer Island in the Canadian Arctic and ended up here. And this is a picture of uh, the fox, the famous uh, female Arctic fox. That, um, that did the long walk. Uh, she is, she was, uh, this is Tommy Sandal. He is a trapper and he worked for me on this project. And he captured her and we put a satellite tag or collar on her, which is shown here. And then she was released. And, and then she, I will now uh, show you um, uh, an animation of, uh, of, uh, the, how far or, or, or the, the fox travel. But I would also just like to tell you something about how far she walked. The total distance that she traveled was actually almost 4,500 kilometers and she walked for 122 days. The distance she walked after she left Spitsbergen or Svalbard to Canada was 3,500 kilometers. And as I said earlier also, the f she had a really, really high speed while walking. It was up to 155 kilometers per day. And uh, as an average uh, or average speed every day, she actually <laughs> walked approximately 40 kilometers uh, per day also. Now I will try to show you the animation. And this is the animation. And I will stop it for a while just to tell you that mm, up here you can actually follow and see uh, see the time scale uh, from March, April, May, June uh, while she's walking. This is uh, Spitz, uh, Svalbard, Spitsbergen, and this map is showing it's a close up, uh, close up when she's she's walking. And I start the animation again. Okay, she's walking out on the sea ice. Go further north. Uh, stopping over, stopping over on the sea ice. Oh, on land on Greenland. She's uh, turning. Oh, out on the sea ice again. Then she's coming back on the Greenland. And soon she will have a really, really, be, be really, really fast. We are following her footstep, footsteps. And now she's actually on, on, on Canada, on Ellesmer Island. Where, she, where the, um, uh, where she ended up. Now I will go back to the to the to my PowerPoint presentation again. Okay. Yeah. So this was um, now you saw the animation of the of the of the of the female that uh, did the long walk. I also would like to tell you that uh, the the satellite tag ended uh, because it's uh, driven by 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 batteries. So the battery ran out. In, uh, in February in 2019. So we are not able to, to follow her any longer. But before I end my talk, I would like to, to tell you uh, about this little girl. She's seven years old and her name is Anna Maria. And uh, she actually joined her parents. Uh, she is the daughter of a trapper, uh, the trapper that, uh, that worked for me on this project. So Anna Maria, she was actually joining when they uh, when we did this project and the maybe the the the, the question that i have got most uh, from this um, 
from journalists and the others uh, about this fox that did the long walk is actually what uh, do the fox have a name has a name and then i said hmm no it has a, have no name so i asked oma maria if she could give the fox a name and she named the fox oma because she said mm, it should be after a, a trapping girl as she is but also it should be named after um, a trapping woman that was married to a quite famous uh, trapper uh, in Svalbard, Anna Oxos. So then, uh, so then, so now you also know that the fox that did the long travel is named uh, was named Anna after Anna. And then I would like to say thank you for listening to me. It was a pleasure to to talk to you, to you, and I like to continue and see how uh, how. Uh, all the questions that you may have. Thank you so much. All right, Ava, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I learned a lot from from tuning in. I had no idea that there were, you know, I knew that they were white in the winter and then uh, darker in the spring. I had no idea there were two different uh, varieties. So that was really cool. And then what a journey over 4,000 kilometers across multiple countries through the sea ice. Uh, pretty amazing journey for such a little, a little creature. All right. Well, I think it's time for some questions. Um, those who are tuning in live via YouTube, now's a good time if you want to pop in some questions in the chat sidebar. Um, give a shout out. It looks like we have some fourth graders in Tucson, Arizona joining us as well. So I want to make sure I give them a shout out. Um, Hilda and Sunova are joining us live via satellite phone. So if you have any questions about uh, Svalbard or what it's like overwintering and living in the trapper's cabin, uh, go ahead and ask. And then, of course, any questions for Ava about uh, the Arctic Fox are fair game. So let's start meeting some of our live camera classrooms and let's get some of their questions in. So let's see. I'm going to go to Mrs. Barnes group first. They're joining us here in Ontario, Canada. I'm going to pop uh, Miss Barnes up here. Hi, Miss Barnes. How are you? Hi, we're doing well here. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. Well, great to see you. Uh, do you have any questions either for Hilda and Sinova or about Arctic foxes? Sure. Um, I have one question from you from a student named Maxim. And he was wondering, uh, Eva, do the Arctic foxes walk better on land or on the snow? Yeah, I saw that, that question. It's a very good question. And of course, uh, we have uh, snow on land as well. So, uh, so they can they can walk uh, on both, I think, uh, on land and and snow. So they are they are just um, so well adapted. So they can walk on land, they can walk on snow, and they can walk on sea on sea ice as well. Uh, so um, I don't know if that is a good a good answer to your question. That was a great answer. Yes, thank you. All right, excellent. Good question to get us started. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Kingston, Ontario. Uh, Ms. McAdams group. Let me bring them in. There they are. How are we doing, Kingston? We're good, thank you. Hey, hey everyone. Yeah. Noisy, apparently. Well, Arctic foxes are pretty exciting, so I, I guess. They kind of are. <laughs> So we had a list of questions started. Um, one of our students wanted to know how old do Arctic foxes live to be? That's also a very good question. And uh, in Svalbard, the oldest fox that I have uh, ever uh, had or seen was, uh, was 16 years old. And I think that's actually a record uh, because um, uh, I, 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 I work with the Arctic fox scientists all around uh, the, the the Arctic, and uh, this is the oldest. Uh, the, the foxes in Svalbard get the oldest. So sixteen year is the oldest uh, from our. That was a male fox. Yeah, and the the fem uh, the oldest female was fourteen. So um, yeah, good question. More. All right, Miss McAdam, why don't you squeeze another one in from your list? Okay. So how many layers of fur do the Arctic fox have? Ah, oh, layers of fur. Okay, they have a very, very, uh, yeah, you can say kind of two layers because they have this very, very, very thick under fur. And it's almost not, if you hold the fox, it's almost not 
it's impossible to actually get down to the skin because the fur is so thick. And then they have this um, this uh, this um, this uh, uh, thinner fur that is um, uh, how to say it in English, but they are a bit longer, so it's uh, it's a co it's covering uh, a bit. I don't remember the English name, sorry, but it's um, the two layers kind of. Yeah, good question. All right, great question. I'm going to grab one from online from our classroom in Minnesota, uh, Miss Gary's class. They're wondering. Um, the blue foxes, do they have uh, a hard time hiding from predators or do they still have pretty good camouflage? Well, um, in the Arctic, Arctic foxes don't have uh, a lot of predators. It's only Arctic foxes and the, and the polar bear. So uh, actually the blue color morph are more common in, uh, in more coastal uh, areas like in Iceland, for example. Uh, where the the snow cover is not uh, continuous because then the blue color uh, morph have a better camouflage and are better in able to actually hunt themselves because, yeah so uh, so um, um, it's uh, in in Svalbard they don't have any enemies or and also in other places in in, in the, they don't have uh, have enemies like that mm. all right um Hilda and Sunova, uh, where you are at Bum Sabu, are you often visited by the Arctic fox? How many do you, th you think you have in the area? That's a great question. Um, they are traveling a little bit, but uh, last winter was a very bad uh, winter for the for the foxes because the reindeers were uh, doing so well uh, with no carcasses, and uh, we had. I think we had a couple of them that were visiting us, but we also saw quite a few dead um, uh, pol uh, polar foxes last winter. And this winter we have seen one fox so far uh, for the last two and a half months. But they are, I, I guess, uh, Eva, no better than us. They have quite a big area to, to protect, so it would be natural maybe not to have so many around, uh, around the hut. But uh, I guess it's it's a few. We do see quite a few um, fox tracks all around Bumpus to Blue and also uh, sometimes up to the roof. So they're definitely around here, uh, but we've only had a few sightings so far since we came back. All right. Um, Miss Clark's group is joining us in uh, Kitchener. Let me bring them in so they can wave. I know their mic wasn't working before, but give me a big wave if you can hear me in Kitchener. All right, there they are. Awesome, good to see ya. Um, I can see a question here put into the chat. So Ms. Clark's group is wondering, Ava, about Arctic foxes digging their den. Can you tell us a little bit about how they do that? Ah, oh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, I can, because mm, the the breeding den is is actually maybe the, the, the difficult part because a breeding den need to be in order and the, and the digged and all that uh, before a couple can can uh, can bring uh, up uh, pups, and that's why our, uh, the the dens are uh, very 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 old, because um, it's um, they need to be put on specific places so that you have a good drainage so that they will not be filled up the tunnels will not be filled up with water when the snow is melting. So it's very, very good to have a good, um, very good area uh, with, with a high quality. And uh, so, uh, but of course, uh, dens can also be new, uh, but most of them are very, very old, but a new den can be digged uh, the, during the summer. Uh, and of course, um, uh, then it can be used the next summer. So uh, a couple need to prepare and dig, eventually dig a new den during one summer and it can be used for pups the next summer then because uh, they, they are mating in, in March uh, and then uh, the female are pregnant for uh, a bit more than 40 days and in, in mid-May they give birth to the, pu uh, to the pups. And then of course during winter the, the den need to be, uh, be, uh, be okay and be, uh, be good. And of course, all the tunnels need to be uh, be digged open during uh, through uh, through the winter, 
So they need to come back to the den and uh, dig the tunnels and protect it from, from, so that other foxes don't take it over. So it, they, it's a lot of work, yeah. Sounds like a lot of work. A lot of maintenance, a lot of renovations and additions. Uh, those Arctic foxes are pretty busy. They are really busy. All right, heading to Mary Hill. Hey, Mrs. Johnson's group, how you doing? We are good, thank you. Vida, come on up. How might we help Arctic foxes? Come closer, honey. Loud? How might we help Arctic foxes? Okay, uh, the, yeah, sorry. Come on yeah, up. She was asking, how could we help the Arctic fox? What can we do to help them, yeah, survive better? Oh uh, yeah, it's that is difficult, of course, because they are wild animals. Um, but um, it's um, uh, it's possible to to help them if you if we try not to disturb them and not disturb them while they have uh, pups in them, because that's a lot of work for them. Uh, of course, we should maybe. I mean. Um, we talked about how climate change can affect, uh, or I did not say it to, to, to specifically, but Hilde and Sinva talked a little bit about the climate warming. And of course, um, um, the sea ice uh, are, are uh, shrinking or disappearing because of the global warming. And of course, that will also affect uh, Arctic foxes in some ways, in fact that they will not have... Uh, uh, be able to hunt on the sea ice or uh, follow the polar bear on the sea ice any longer. So maybe we should, uh, we can try as good as we can to um, to stop the climate uh, change. I know that is a, a very, very uh, a big thing to, to do. But again, if we all put our uh, our effort together, uh, we maybe we can be able to do it. And your the the voice of all the the young people is very important in that. All right, absolutely. It is, it is a big problem. It's tricky, um, especially with uh, you know climate change being such a big global problem. It may seem like you know one person, one student acting isn't a lot, but when everybody acts together, right? If you ignore that, how it feels like it might be small. If everybody's working together, it can have a really big impact. Yeah. All right, I'm going to bring in another classroom here. We've got Mrs. Uh, Del Pino's fabulous fives. Give me a big wave. Fives, there they are. All right, very cool. Um, they are joining us from Thunder Bay. Good to see you. And we're excited for a question. Uh oh, for whatever reason, the mic was working when you came in. We're not getting any sound now. All right, fabulous fives. You might have to send me a question in the chat bar uh, and I'll keep an eye out for it and we'll work it in. Oh, darn, we had it when we when you first came in. Uh, while we wait for a question in the chat, I'm gonna grab another question here from the, uh, the YouTube chat. Um, so Mr. Cox would like to know, do the fox pups uh, stay with their families in like a group or do they eventually leave? Yeah, a very good question. Um, Arctic foxes uh, stay in the family group on the den, in the denning period. That starts uh, from, from May when the pups are born, and then it ends approximately around August. So it's during, it's during summer uh, time, then the foxes, uh, the parents and the pups are together on the den. Then uh, during the autumn and winter, uh, the family do not stay together any longer. Then the pups need to find their own life. So then they leave the den. So as, as uh, they some go, uh, stay quite close uh, if there are enough food, but others can also be go quite far. Uh, so uh, during winter they are more nomadic. Also the parents, the adult, the foxes live a more nomadic life. And then it's really you know in Svalbard in winter all the birds that are breeding there during summer are gone. There's no no birds at all, so it's the only thing they can find is uh, maybe they have digged down some food during summer. They can find a carcass of a reindeer or, or a seal. They can follow a polar bear and maybe find some food. 
So life is tough, life is hard. Most foxes actually, young foxes die during their first, first year of life. So they don't stay in family groups during the whole year. That's only uh, only during summer when they have given birth to, to the pups. But very good question. All right, I'm putting our Fab Fives back in if they want to give us another big wave. Uh, their teacher sent us in a question here. So do we have an idea of how many Arctic foxes there are? How big is the population? Is it a healthy population right now or is it... Um, is it threatened or uh, endangered? Mm. Um, um, yeah, we don't know how many foxes uh, there are uh, all over in, in the Arctic, but there are probably more than hundreds and thousands uh, of foxes. As you saw in my presentation, the Arctic is uh, the circumpolar Arctic. So we have huge areas in the Russian Arctic continent. There are Alaska, you have the Canadian Arctic, you have Greenland, you have Iceland, you, and you have uh, Scandinavia, where Norway and Sweden and Finland is uh, as well. Uh, so, but in some places, Arctic foxes are endangered. And that is in the mainland of Norway, in Svalbard. The foxes uh, is in a quite good, uh, good condition. The population is stable. But on the mainland of Norway and Sweden, we call it Scandinavia. Uh, there, the population of foxes has uh, decreased uh, and is actually, they are doing a kind of a rescue operation in that they are, um, they are um, uh, breeding up pups uh, on the farm and, and releasing them in the nature and helping them with food as well. Uh, and so, so in some places, the foxes are not doing well, but in uh, most other places so far, the foxes are doing much, uh, much better. And uh, I also said that the foxes don't have uh, um, predators, but that's not completely true. We don't have it in Svalbard, but in other places, uh, you have the red fox. The red fox is much bigger and stronger than the Arctic fox. And because of the climate warming, the red fox are living further and further north. And they are then competing with the Arctic fox. So uh, it is, uh, they are threatened by uh, the Arctic foxes, may in some places also be threatened by the red fox that are taking over the dens and also may are able to kill art, uh, Arctic foxes. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Hilden Sunwa, I want to bring you back into the conversation and ask about, uh, you know, where you are right now. You are seeing a lot of problems firsthand. You are seeing ocean plastics. Uh, when they wash up uh, on the beach, you are seeing climate change uh, in the Arctic, which, you know, many of us may not know it's warming twice as fast as the rest uh, of the planet. And in the, you know, the year plus that you spent there, you had one winter where things were cold and you had lots of sea ice. And this winter is completely different. Uh, you know, not as cold. The sea ice hasn't come in yet. You know, what is your message for students or really anybody uh, who's tuning in about our planet and climate change? A big question. Well, it's a, that's a big question, Joe. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's very interesting uh, to be here with no distraction except just the wildlife that Eva's talking about and the wildlife that we've shared uh, and the changes you, you're explaining right now What's so strange is that every single day we see change uh, all the time. It's there is no there is no like one day where it's not windy, or there's no one day where it's it, it, it's it's just sunny. So the weather here and the climate is forever changing. And if we we've, we've learned many things, but one thing we have learned is that climate change is not new. It's something that's. Uh, it happens naturally every year. It's uh, it's it's part of our our history, so to speak. But what is really um, timely and really relevant for the fact that we're here right now is the extreme changes that we're experiencing. And I think you couldn't have a better example than one that you just shared, Joe. Where last year at this time it was minus seventeen degrees Celsius, and today what is it, Hilda? It's uh, it's minus three right now, and with no ice on the fjord, um, we collected some polar bear poop the other day, and it had um, 
it had uh, kelp in it. So it, it's like everything is having to adapt. And that's one thing that our planet is really good at, including us humans, right, with COVID, is we have amazing adaptation skills. But what's, what, what's crazy right now and what's really important for everybody to understand is that the planet can only adapt so much year after year after year. So if there's a message for all of, you know, the wonderful students that are, that are um, on the call today from Canada, the U.S., and, and anywhere else, it's continue to ask the great questions. Continue to stay really, really interested and curious in things like foxes, sea ice, polar bears. You know, get out there and collect plastic. Um, it's what you said earlier, Joe. Not one person can fix it, but uh, collectively, we can certainly make a difference. So um, just staying active and perhaps finding a, an, a really cool project to engage in as a citizen scientist, which is what Hilda and I are. Uh, we're celebrating Global Women in Science Month, and neither one of us have science degrees, but we are citizen scientists, and that's that's something every single person on this call could be. All right. And, you know, you brought up uh, ocean plastic. Uh, we do have a neat little animation here that I'm going to share as we wrap things up today. So uh, bear with me as I play that little uh, animation. Pretty cool. Uh, oops. Oh, there it goes. Waste that ends up in the ocean is transported by ocean currents and can end up here in the Arctic. This marine litter impacts wildlife. Animals can be harmed and even killed by eating litter or becoming entangled. IECO's Clean Seas Project was launched to be part of the global effort to combat marine plastic pollution. IECO members are rethinking routines and practices in order to reduce the amount of single-use plastic on vessels. In addition to finding greener solutions, IECO members' efforts include beach cleanups, education and knowledge sharing. IECO members have been participating in cleanup activities for over two decades. During your trip, you can take part in cleaning Arctic beaches by picking up any plastic or other marine litter you find during landings, while making sure not to stray away from your group. Oh, we're if you spot items that are out of reach, bring them out to your expedition team. Heads up and we'll mm -hmm. try to get in. Your ship will collect the waste and ensure that it is disposed of properly. Some of the waste collected is studied by scientists. By better understanding the problem of marine litter, we can find solutions. Thank you for being part of the effort to combat plastic pollution. You can continue at home by following the principles of reduce, reuse and recycle to minimise your plastic footprint. You can also consider taking part in cleanups at home and other places. All right, so, um, you know, the, the theme this month, uh, as well as celebrating women in science and exploration, uh, is also uh, the citizen science is ocean plastics. So if you would like to learn more with your classroom, I put a uh, link up here that takes you to our website, but we have a special page for Hearts in the Ice. And each month we have different themes, different speakers, different story maps with different uh, curriculum and videos and information for students to check out. So if you head over there and look for this month, you will find all kinds of information about uh, really cool citizen science projects, as well as the impact that ocean plastic are having around the world and in the Arctic. And we're going to try one more thing before we wrap up today. Hilda and Sunivar are going to try to join via video for a couple seconds. So they're so far north, the signal sometimes lets them in, it sometimes doesn't. So we're going to cross our fingers and see if we get to do a goodbye, a wave to them uh, up in Bumsabu. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to say goodbye via satellite phone. So Hilda and Sunva, let me know uh, how things are looking. Well, fingers crossed that we get to see you for a couple seconds today. Fingers crossed. It looks like it's trying to load right now. So um, let's, uh, let's give it a couple of seconds here. Thanks so much for your patience, Joe. Oh, of course. Um, 
that spinning wheel, you know? <laughs> it's that spinning wheel trying to load. I know. I know. Uh, it's important to remember just how far north you are. And, you know, there is no internet. There is no phone lines. There's there's a satellite connection and it's no, no Netflix. That's right. No, we're closer to North Pole. And here is um, satellite, the only solution. Um, it doesn't look very promising. It's still yeah. spinning, Joe. Um, but um, I'm sure you have shared. Uh, did you share the picture of uh, us from today when we were out running with Etta? I did. did I shared. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can pop that up one more time as we wrap up today. Just give me a moment to pop it up on the screen. Of the crew reunited and back together, which is awesome. Oh, it's so amazing. And it's uh, us running out here in minus temperatures is a good uh, shout out for everybody on the call. And remember to stay active. And you know what? We're entering the broadcast studio now, Joe. It's loading. Okay. Um, so, well, we just might be getting in. We're holding our breath. It's it's loading. And in the meantime, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Eva for sharing all that great knowledge about our office. Um, she she has um, she has really been working in the field for more than twenty years, as long as I've known her for twenty five years actually. So. So oh, that, that was really great. Um, and we, uh, Eva, I forgot to tell you, we had a great time again. That's the white bird that we have up here that's uh, overwintering to get with us around in this area. We had a great experience the other day uh, with a close up with the, with the ptarmigan. And they they have the, the polar foxes as the, the only um, predator, and, and they're kind of tame, I would say. You, you come quite close and get to, get to sort of feel. Oh, we just lost the satellite connection, which happens sometimes. Uh, hopefully, Hilda and Sonova can come back in one more time. We'll say goodbye because it doesn't look like the video is cooperating with us today. Um, sometimes the weather is too much for the satellite signal. Sometimes we only get to see them for a minute. Um, it's it's a tough connection when you're that far north. But Ava, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your your adventures, uh, tracking Arctic foxes, studying, researching. It was great to, to see so many great pictures. And again, to see the track of that one uh, uh, amazing Arctic fox. A quick question that came up in the chat multiple times. Do they swim? Yeah. Yeah. Arctic foxes do swim. They cross. Uh, we have seen them cross uh, crossing big, uh, big um, uh, rivers, and even I have also got a um, got a film uh, from uh, from someone that was uh, taking tourists out on the uh, on the sea, and suddenly they saw something white floating on the on the surface, and that was actually an Arctic fox uh, in winter fur swimming <laughs> somewhere. So yes, they they, they do swim. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, uh, Hilda and Sinova, it doesn't look like we're going to get lucky with the connection today. Um, I do want to give a big shout out to all the groups that join us on YouTube from Canada, Ontario, Alberta, uh, Arizona, Minnesota. Um, I want to give a shout out to all of our camera classrooms. As per usual, you guys were great. Thanks for all the awesome questions. Ava, thank you for joining us today. And Hilda and Sinova, uh, a pleasure as always. And we're doing this again on the 25th for another another connection. We're going to talk about, well, what we're doing now. We're going to talk about satellites and satellite connection. Yeah. Joe, thank you so much. And um, Susan, talk about, and thanks so much to all of the teachers and students that joined up today. Stay curious and, and stay engaged. And uh, you are our future. And we, we need you to be engaged in this, uh, this uh, work that we have in front of us towards the climate change. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Join us on the 25th uh, at noon Eastern if you can as well. Check out all the Hearts in the Ice uh, story maps, information, pictures, videos uh, at this website down here. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Ava. Have a great uh, rest of the day, rest of the evening. Thank you so much.